Well, thank you very much to Zainab for being here tonight. Thank you for to you all for being here tonight. Zainab has an extraordinary story, as many of you know, um, and she's going to be talking to us about that tonight. And let's let's get started straight away. All right. Thank you, Zainab. You, your family was invited into the household of Saddam Hussein. Your, your father was asked to be Saddam Hussein's personal pilot. I think you were about 11 at the time. Just tell us how the family felt when that happened and what it was like to live in Saddam Hussein's household. Um, before I answer that, I actually want to acknowledge two things. First, I'm so touched to see so many Iraqis uh, in here, and I want to thank you very, very much for that. Um, and a lot of supporters of Women for Women are here too, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I never lived in Saddam Hussein's household. Um, that was part of my parents' resistance, actually. Um, resistance was not, sometimes it's not in big ways. Uh, sometimes it's in small ways. Um, so even when he asked us to, even when he asked my father to be his pilot in 1982, um, but before that he actually came into their social life as well. And they tried to apologize from him to, you know, he would invite them and they would make excuses. My father was a commercial pilot, so they often used the excuses that he was traveling not to make up the, not to <coughs> come to the invite. Until one day they talked about 76. Um, they talk about how they went to a party, which was, this is the 70s in Iraq. There were lots of, um, uh, what do you call it, country clubs and professional clubs and all of these things. And they went to a party and they decided to stop over by their friend's home. And they knocked on the door. This is very typical in Iraq. You don't call your friends also before you enter. You just, right, we just show up. Um, they knocked on the door and the friend said, Saddam Hussein is in the living room. And my parents always talked about that moment. To enter the house would be to accept a friendship that they really did not want. And to exit the house would be an insult that could lead to their, to their death or whatever, or whatever consequences, but it's not going to be a pretty consequences. And, and they entered the house. And I actually often um, wish that I've never uh, that I don't get put in that position, or rather, any of us get put in that position. It's not a good position to be having that choice, and it takes a lot of courage to turn your back and say, "I'm actually going to leave." Um, and that was the beginning of the friendship that was informal in the in the 70s, uh, became formal in the 90s. I mean, in the 80s, when he asked formally my father to be uh, his pilot. And that was, a talk, I would call it, a takeover of the whole household. So we were given a farmhouse in one of his farm compounds. We were required to go to spend every weekend with him, with, in his farmhouse, not with him. Um, and we would always be dressed up in case he showed up. Um, and there were rules. You have to smile when he smiled. You have to cry when he cried. Um, the, so, so you encounter him on a daily basis. Sometimes if he asked us to come in, in the middle of the weekdays, we would all have to pack up and, and go. We could not say no to him, but even the kids were enlisted in that relationship. Um, um, we all had to be at his disposal. Now, um, the devil is a fallen angel. So in the process, I learned you see him as a man, as an uncle, as we called him um, when we were kids. And you also see the fear that my parents had uh, in front of him. Because there would have been no way of refusing the request that your father became the pilot, the personal pilot. You, no, you can't. No, absolutely you can. And that's, you know, being close to the devil did not mean that you are safer from danger. You are really that much closer to danger. Um, and I actually really want to take a moment to acknowledge that, yes, we were so close to danger. Yes, it was close, so, to, so close to Saddam. But by far, uh, I, I don't want to deny the privileges that came with the relationship. There were privileges, material privileges, cars and helicopters and travels and whatever we wanted. There were all the material privileges. That just didn't protect you when you were close to him. So, and that was amazing thing about him. So you would have dinner, a normal dinner with him and uh, relax dinner and he would then talk about how he just killed his best friend the night before. And I would like be sitting in the other room and seeing my parents pale, scared to death. 
um, but they are all vulnerable. And that's how I think he weaved in fear within us. And in many ways, I thought it's, fear became so much part of my own DNA um, that you become so afraid of everything. Uh, growing their resistance, my parents' small resistance is that they refused to move to the palace um, compound. And they said, no, we really prefer living in our own home. And they did not send me to the palace school. And they sent me to a normal school, not only a normal school, a school that was on the margin between a, a lower middle class neighborhood to a poor neighborhood. It was a new experimental school. So in the daytime, that allowed me to actually talk to classmates who would talk about public executions in their own neighborhood, with men being pinned to the wall. And anybody who had a gun could just shoot um, at this person. And then, and, and they talked about their own father's executions or killing in the war. That was the Iran-Iraq war. And I know I couldn't tell my parents that. I knew they would be too scared to know I know some of these things. And then in, in the evening, I would go to the palace with him and his daughters and his wife and all of that. And, and so the discrepancy between what I was seeing in the daytime with my classmates and between how isolated the palace was. And that was... Part of the things that I'm so grateful for my parents to do that, to allow me, without them knowing, to see this different lives in Iraq. But you're describing a very pervasive fear that was in the, you felt it in the palaces. It was certainly being felt out on the streets. How did you personally feel about Saddam Hussein, the man? I mean, many people here have heard so many s stories. Many people here, I'm sure, have personal stories of, of uh, life in Saddam Hussein's regime, but how did you personally feel about him as a man? <sighs> the devil is a fallen angel. <laughs> so there are times, I mean, I called him Ammo, which is uncle, and that's the proper way to call a father's friend, basically. So there are many times in which he was just Ammo for me. Um, we ate with him, he laughed a lot, he gave me definitely lots of slacks on a lot of times which I violated some rules without knowing that I was violating them drinking tea before he drank it, and he's like, oh, let Zainab alone. Oh, small things, you know. Um, he liked dancing. So he was indulgent towards you? Um, to, I, I was a kid. He was in, you know, what you could be, you could be silly if you're a kid, uh, and definitely if you're a, a girl or a woman, you sort of get more slack, you know. Um, and my parents were not political people. They really, and that's why they were safe uh, to be around him. Um, and so... I saw part of him as Ammu, really. But it was so clear, as uncle, but it's so clear even as a teenager, with my own, um, own observation, regardless of my parents' observation, it was so clear that we were vulnerable to him. Very, very, very clear. To, to give you an example, I was once in the, one, there were three couples with two other couples with us and in the house of one of them, and I heard him scream at my mother. I was upstairs and I could hear him. And it was so clear that this is scary. It, it, there was no ambivalence that this is very scary. And he screamed at her. My mom was the, had a dark skin. And he ta uh, called her uh, Ajmiya, which is uh, an Ir of Iranian origin, um, in a very derogatory uh, way, because she did not welcome his mistress into our house. And so it was small things like that where you know this is your mom actually could go. I mean, this is not an exaggeration. So you see the nice side of him. He liked collecting cowboy hats, for example, or different kinds of hats. But you also see my mother in the meantime, when we go back home, crying and trying to commit suicide over and over and over again. And she would tell me I could see the prison bars, but I can't prove they exist. And so there was, I was always living in that dichotomy of actually seeing my mother trying to kill herself um, and crying, and I didn't know why, but you know that the context in which we just came from was scary. And there was fun part. I mean, you know, when he sent you a helicopter to go to a you know, hunting trip, it was fun. Uh, for, a, for, for, you know, there was these fun moments. I don't ever want to deny that. Um, but also there were these scary moments that you coexist with it. I remember my mother once crying to her mother and putting her head on her lap, and she would tell her, I can't know bad things about him because I'm so scared he would know that I know that. 
he could read my Get eyes. Get inside her right. head. And so she's so scared because my aunt was so much against him and always talked against him. She's like, please tell her not to tell me anything because I'm so scared. Are there any particular incidents that you remember? I know you've talked before about a, a time when you went hunting with Saddam Hussein. Um, yeah, this is one of one of the you know trips. So when he called us, we had to pack. It didn't matter if you had exams or whatever, which is very important back home for kids to go to school and do well in school. Um, the teachers were expected to whatever adjust, um, and we went to a hunting trip, a duck hunting trip. I was 16 years old or 15 years old at the time. And the way he, he kept us, the girls and the women, in the, um, whatever, uh, in the camp area. Um, and he took the boys and the, and the men um, to five helicopters. And the way he hunted is that he surrounded the five helicopters with a, he surrounded a flock of ducks with five helicopters at a very low, a very, uh, what do you call it, near range. Uh, and then he opened the doors, all the doors. I could see it, it was very low. And then he would shoot from the helicopter, you know, it's, but it's really close range. I mean, like it says, you know, and, and the helicopter, and the ducks, it's so, you know, it's their ducks. Um, but I don't eat ducks anymore. <laughs> um, they were just screaming and falling, you know, and it was like, it felt like a massacre because they were a flock of them. He was clo killing them from a very short mm. range. And I just remember, and the ducks, when they scream, they scream like uh, humans, I feel like, ah, you know. And I was just a teenager, and I sat crying. And I sat screaming and saying, this is a massacre, this is a massacre. It was something simple. I was 15 years old. I don't remember the rules all the time, so I didn't remember. And I just remember my mother running towards me, holding my head from the back and shoving it in my head. And she's like, shh, shh, you know. And she was looking around like, so nervous because she was so afraid if one of his soldiers or bodyguards heard me calling this a massacre that this could be dangerous for us. Your mother was very, very frightened for you, wasn't she? And was that the reason that she arranged for you to, to marry in what turned out to be a very unhappy and abusive relationship? So my mother was a school mother, I thought even though she tried to kill herself a lot, but I loved her a lot. Um, and she would always hold me as a teenager and she would tell me, you should never, ever let any man touch you the wrong way or talk with you the wrong way. And she would like actually like shake, shake me with a passion and I'm like, what did I do? I didn't do anything. I don't even have a man in my life, you know? Um, and she would tell me, never learn how to cook or clean because no man should, te should expect that you know how to cook and clean just because you're a woman. And that you have to always be independent. And you have to always stand on your feet and you should always be strong. So all of these things that my mom told me, and you should, she was adamant that I have to marry for love, which is in a, in a country where there are lots of the marriages are arranged marriages. It was pretty cool. <coughs> um, and all of a sudden, I was 19, and my mom comes and she's like, you got a marriage proposal from this guy in America, um, and you need to accept it. And I'm like, what? You know, all your life you told me all of this, and now you want me to accept this? And she's like, you really need to accept it. And she would cry and cry, and my father was there, and he, we all were like, it doesn't make sense. And she would say, over my dead body, my daughter is to leave. And then we go to Chicago, and we are in the way to the wedding, and my father stops the car, and he says, I don't just think this is right. And I don't think it's right. I don't like the man. And my mother cries and says, she is not going back to Iraq over my dead body. Did she explain why? No, my mother? no. And there was just crying, and I don't want to see my, I never wanted to see my mom or my father to cry, actually. Until today, I do whatever they want when they cry. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, um, and so I accepted the marriage. And I went, and I remember actually the marriage ceremony because in our tradition we get asked 13 times, do you want to, or 12 times, do you want to accept this marriage? And you think about it, do you want it? And I was like, every time I was like, maybe I can say no, maybe I can say no, maybe I can say, until I finally was so scared and I said yes, and all my brothers and my father stormed out of the room crying. So it was like a funeral. And the husband, um, and then right after that, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And my parents had gone back home right within a month. Um, so my parents are back home, Iraq and base Kuwait, and that man ended up doing every single thing my mother told me not to tolerate. 
every single thing. He physically, verbally abused me and, and just every, he just really, he was the nightmare. And he expected me to cook and clean and just produce babies, you know. <laughs> um, so he was... And you know how to do them. No, you I didn't. That, but I have since then become a very good cook, actually. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but he but he did that and it was like her tattooing in my brain the the things that I have to uh, do or not to do and so I remember one time he violated me in major ways and I packed up and left and it's a long story of how I packed up and left and I had two suitcases I remember of nice very nice clothes but I had four hundred dollars in my pocket only and I had nothing uh, no work permits, no visa. I mean, I had a, v a tourist visa. I can't go back home, and I wanted to go back home. And I remember just going to the immigration office and said, you tell me what I do, because I don't know what to do. And since then, I stayed in America. I got working permit. I was married for the longest time for a, with a wonderful um, man. But that was the day that I vowed that I will start my life all over again that A, I will never tell anybody I knew Saddam Hussein because I honestly really believe that if I told you that I knew him, you stop seeing me, that you will only see him. Mm -hmm. and, and I was so conscious of that because that's how I was, I was treated in Iraq. People only treated me vis-a-vis -vis my relationship with him. Um, and so I never told anybody about my parents' relationship with him. And I started my life from zero, and I eventually, you know, was married to my former husband, and and I, and that's how my life started, and that's when I learned about the rape camps in Bosnia, and that was the beginning of my new journey. I was going to ask about your new journey. Was it that ab abusive relationship that led to your work with Women for Women, and 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 your work with women who are suffering and have suffered violence around the world? Um, it was two things. It was my mother telling me a lot, actually, about stories of women. So I actually really knew that I wanted to work with women since I was 15 years old. And I remember the moment in which my mom was driving, and she's, she often told me about violence against women and what women go through and all of that. And I turned to her and I said, when I grow up, I want to help women. And she said, yes, you can do it. And I'm so glad, you know, she didn't dismiss it or laughed at me because since I started Women for Women International, many people laughed at me and they, you know, joked, oh, you know, Mother Teresa, um, you know, why don't you go and get a job and all of these things, you know. My mother never did that. My mother was like, yes, you can do it, honey. And I'm so grateful for that. And the second part is I was actually very angry at my mother upon my divorce from my first husband. Um, I didn't see her, first of all, for I, I didn't know where, whether my parents were alive or dead for many months. So they called me the day before the war. Um, and my mom just told me, gave me her will and said, in case we die, this is what we have. Um, and you should know that. And I didn't see my family for nine years. Um, so I was very angry at her. How could she do this to me? How could she send me to America on my own with no money, marrying me off to a jerk, you know, and he was, you know, and, and, do, and leave me alone. Um, and it took me, my work in Bosnia and Kosovo and Rwanda and Congo and Afghanistan to really understand and to go a full circle. It took me working with war zones. I remember my mother called me when I was in Sarajevo once in the besiege. She found out, I don't know, my, my ex-husband told her, you know. She said, I get you out of Iraq, so you go to Bosnia, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, but there was something about that and I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I was so adamant. I would go to rape survivors. I would go to victims like, you must tell the story. You must tell the truth. That's only when we break our silence can we actually break the vicious cycle that women are stuck in. And I think all women are stuck. This is not an Iraqi issue. It's not a Congolese issue. It's not a Bosnian issue. I think all women really are disproportionately impacted by all the worst things that are happening in the, in the world. Um, and it took me nine years took me my mo to know that my mother is dying and coming to visit me in America to get some treatment to understand why the connections between my own work and my passion towards working with women survivors of wars and between my own story and why I was so uh, passionate about that.
We'll talk about your work in a minute, but just briefly, did your mother ever explain to you why she was so insistent on that marriage? Yeah, um, she had Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, so she, um, just one of the worst diseases you can have, you're imprisoned in your own body. Uh, so the brain was intact, but you lose your muscles and she could not uh, talk anymore. So she wrote me the story. Um, and basically the last six months of her life. Um, and she basically was wary. She, she thought that Saddam was making comments about me and that she could not protect me. And it was, you know, I was 19 when I left Iraq. I really didn't see him in any way but uncle, but knowing that he was a bad uncle, um, but not vis-a-vis uh, -vis me. Now, as an adult woman today, I can see that. I, and, I, you know, um, but so there were lots of incidents in, my, in which my mother said, do you remember when he said that? Remember when he did that? Remember? Um, and, the, and she said, I needed to get out before it gets out of control. I needed you to leave because he was making a lot of remarks that it could be taken neutral or it could be she panicked. She absolutely panicked about it. And it could be, it was incidents like one day we were um, in his farm compound, one of his farms compound, and he asked uh, to swim. And so everyone jumped, of course. You know, everyone had their bathing suit and jumped. And I said, I did not bring my bathing suit. And he said, you know, well, why don't you jump in your underwear? And I was like, no. And why don't you jump in your clothes? No. Well, actually, he said, go to, how about go to my room, get my underwear on and his uh, upper or whatever. And I was like, no. And he said, OK, put my dishtasha on, which is uh, a men's wear, like a long um, nightgown for men. Um, and I said, no. And he said, OK, jump in your clothes. And I said, no. And I, and I remember seeing my parents behind him, not saying no words whatsoever. But they, are, they looked like, and they can't even give me marks, but they looked like holding their uh, ears to my, you know, to my breath to say what I'm going to say. And it was incidents like that, you know, or her, him telling her she's becoming a very beautiful woman, or, 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 or whatever, that she freaked out. And she said, I needed you to get out. Now, in the process of her telling me the story, she also told me about how many of her friends have gone through so many things. Um, and I actually, it, it's, it's a story. So it was so and 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 so um, that it was too much around her. And she knew so much around her. It was very ironic for me because in that moment, I discovered that she was no longer than Congolese women who often offer me their daughters and beg me to take their daughters to give them a better life in America. Um, and that she just did that through the marriage. And that was the only way she knew how to do it. How did you feel and how did she feel when the war to topple Saddam Hussein came? Well, she died 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago because of that disease. Um, I. Um, I do not like Saddam. I never liked Saddam Hussein. And I was against the war. I think he was a dark cloud on all of Iraqis. Not, I mean, my family is perhaps the privileged Iraqis, but really a dark cloud. But no change can be sustainable, in my opinion, if it's coming from the outside. And that it must be owned by the people. And I'm now speaking as an Iraqi because I feel unless we own our own actions, unless we own our own change, we're going to be stuck in a victimhood stage. Saddam used to oppress us, and now Americans are oppressing us. And it's, we need to take that control of our own country and lead to that change. So I'm, him leaving is a good thing, but not through that way. Uh, because the country is destroyed right now. It's utterly destroyed. Now, there are two incidents. One is when he was captured. I, I cried twice, one he, when he was captured and one when he was executed. And I can't deny that. Um, when he was captured, I was with a, a group of Iraqis. We were doing training on women's rights. Um, and I remember it was we were in Jordan, and a lot of people were laughing and clapping and all of that. And he looked so pathetic in that moment that I didn't want to celebrate someone else's humiliation, even if it was Saddam Hussein. And it's the truth. I, you know, I maybe judge a million times about that, but I actually had tears in my eyes. I was like, I don't want to. It's a very pathetic situation to see him in that stage, even though I don't like him. And when he was executed, I cried for the country. Because I felt through his trial, we could have our own truth and reconciliation.
Through his trial, I thought, I wanted for us to tell the history of what happened to Iraqis because I believe our history is not written yet. And you still have people, whether they are Sunni or Shia or Kurds or whatever, who want someone to witness the stories of what they've gone through. And his trial could have provided the window of opportunities for us to tell the stories. But it, it, they killed him so fast, so short uh, of a trial. So that was one of the, it's like, I felt like this was the last hope that we had for our own process, our own healing process. And the second one is for the rule of law, that we need to apply the best rule of law for the worst criminal of Iraq. And if we can't give him a fair trial and a thorough, transparent trial, then what's the hope for their re a regular person in Iraq, whether they, he or she were accused innocently or, or not? Um, and so that I cried for that case for the country um, much more than for him. I know you've recently been back in the country for work. How, how did you find things now, particularly for women? Well, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. So I told you about how he visited us informally in the 70s and formally in the 80s. He would come to our home and with the entourage and all of that. Um, I'll answer through the story of the house I grew up in, actually. It was a very normal neighborhood. It's the airline neighborhood. You know, that's how we categorize neighborhoods in Iraq um, and by professions. Um, in the 90s, he was very mad at, the, at my family. My mother left right after the war in Iraq. And he was very angry at her. He called her a traitor. My, fa my father had an investigation against him, and he punished us economically. He did not physically torture us, but he <coughs> completely isolated the family economically, and they struggled big time economically. He cut us off. Um, and so the house was run down, actually. And when I went in the 19 1999 to bury my mother, the house was completely run down. And in 2003, I went just before the invasion and to clean up the house, to, you know, to A, get my, fa my brother out so he doesn't serve in the army. The second was to do interviews to see what the Iraqis are saying. And the third was like clean up the house from all the papers and all the pictures because working with refugees in Bosnia and Kosovo and other countries I know at the end of the day is that, ba pa you know, plastic bag there you put all your papers and pictures that people keep at the end of the day. Um, and, and preparing for all of that, and right after the invasion, I was there. Within three weeks of the invasion, I was there um, to try to see how we can set up women for women's offices over there. And my, my brother, it was a time of optimism. A lot of people thought that it's going to be good, and it's true. A lot of the things that President Bush said that Iraqis welcome them is true. You know, my uncle was distributing Cuban cigars and whiskeys to American soldiers until I told him, stop doing that and give me the Cuban cigars, you know. Uh, you know, they don't have access to it there, you know. Um, and so, but it's true. And in that period, in that first six months, my brother said, I want to rebuild, uh, to fix the house, and I want to get married. And we had a big ceremony and all of that. Well, immediately after that, he got a uh, kidnapping threat, and we got him out of the country. The story is the house was occupied by one of the militias, and it became an execution center for a year and a half, in which our neighbors were telling us that the, uh, the militias, the Mahdi army it was, they were executing about 20 men a day and then putting them in the cul-de-sac in front of the house. Last April, my father called me crying, and he said, the militia left, but now it's a brothel. And I was like, okay, but at least they're having sex instead of killing each other. Mm -hmm. Though trafficking against girls in Iraq has tremendously increased. As young as 12 years old and 13 year old of girls are being trafficked within the country and outside the country. And prostitution is by far not, um, it's an, a very abusive thing that the Iraqi women are going through. And so I was like, okay, but still. Then the army took it. The brother was for six months. Then the army took it. This is not April of uh, 09, it's 08. The army took it for an, a year and a half. And, and when my father went to get them out, they said, well, you have to pay us $30,000 bribe. And I tell the story because I think it has all the elements of what happened in Iraq. The bribe, corruption, is the second most corrupt country in the world, according to the World Bank, after Somalia. It's, this is, you know. Um, destruction, the country is absolutely destroyed. According to the Human Rights Ministry in Iraq, 40% of Iraqi population are living below poverty rates. 
let alone those who are living on the margin of poverty rates. Um, there are one million widows, four million orphans, uh, three in four, uh, three divorces in every four marriages. The, the society is has the country is destroyed. Agriculture is absolutely utterly destroyed. Dates, uh, palm trees are producing one third of the dates they used to produce. Um, seven years ago in Iraq was the number one producer of dates. Uh, you can't even buy a cucumber that is produced in Iraq, that is grown in Iraq. The manufacturing industry is destroyed. Uh, still today, we have one hour of electricity. I was there in July, and we have one hour of electricity a day still. And so it's utterly so sad to see from so many different elements, from the corruption that is actually so painful to the destruction of the country. I met a woman in her 50s, and it's that generation of women that are still the activists. Uh, they still remember the, the time. So that's, Why uh, is that? Because their, their era was a good era. They, you know, I was reading the 1959 Constitution, the Family Status Law, and it was such a, an inspiration. The people who wrote the Family Status Law in 1950, this is 58, I'm sorry, they said, we cannot actually aspire to get in a strong country if we do not protect women in Iraq uh, and protect their legal and economic rights. So the law had a lot of issues to improve, but it was written in 1958 and is actually relatively a progressive law for that era. And so women in their 50s, I would say 40s probably would be the margin of it, still grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and they remember the times in which it was good, in which they had freedom and they moved along. It's actually the women who are in their 20s today that tend to be illiterate while their mother are literate. Uh, it's the women in their 20s, if they are middle class or upper middle class, the girls were asking me, did you really drive when you went to the university in Iraq? Uh, they lost the memory of the Iraq we had from 20, 30 years ago. To what extent do you blame the war and its aftermath for setting back the status, the position, the rights of women? Well, well, you can't not blame Saddam. So you, he has, he had, you know, take a lot of responsibilities of that. So I want to acknowledge that. And you can't ignore the sanctions in the Iraq in the 90s, which had its own toll in reshaping Iraqi society, both in making it much more traditional and much more religious and much more tribal, with Saddam's guidance and, and leadership in, in moving it to that direction. And you also cannot uh, ignore the role of the uh, of the invasion in that. T to give you an example, and it's not about women's rights, but it is uh, related to Iraq. First thing Brummer did, one of the first thing, is that he imposed a five percent um, flat tax on all imports. Now it's not heard of in much uh, many other countries. That instantly destroyed the farming uh, agriculture sector in Iraq and instantly destroyed the manufacturing sector in Iraq, where you talk to manufacturers or farmers who said, we can't compete with goods from Turkey or Syria or Iran that are simply cheaper. So it destroyed the infrastructure of a country coming from a country, the U.S., that subsidizes its farms and farmers and subsidizes its manufacturers and all of that. So I, you can't ignore that role. When it comes to women's rights, um, you can't absolutely ignore America's role in that. Uh, Iraqi women were demanding 50 percent participation in all Iraqi governments, and they had every single right um, to, to demand that 50 percent. And it was Ambassador Brummer, who I met him myself, and he said, there is no way we're going to give uh, a certain percentage for women. And after many negotiations, now they have 25 percent of representation. But it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't only the Iraqis who were resisting such thing, or Iraqi men, it was Americans as well, very much part of that. In my recent trip to Iraq, I, I was invited um, to speak to uh, one of the bases in Diwaniya, American bases, and because they heard about the program that we do. And they said, we'd like to learn for what you're doing. So I go and present them, and for two hours, they question me about two things. Why do you focus on poor women? Uh, we, we, we like your program, but we just don't make, we don't see the sense of focusing on poor women. You should focus on middle class women. Now, you have a population that is majority poor right now. America is fighting someone like Muqtada Sadr, whose only card blanche is his popularity among the, pu the poor. 
And if we're not going to actually address the poor's reality, we, this war is not about guns. This is not about uh, fighting with m more weapons and all of that. This war is about economic development and, and actually stability for people, in my opinion. Go to Sadr City and give people electricity for 24 hours and good schooling and good jobs, everyone will calm down. You know, it's about economic and social justice in many ways. Um, and so they, and then they were questioning, it's like, but women's rights in Iraq, it doesn't move. It, the Iraqi society doesn't accept women's rights. And with me where there were two colleagues who have been implementing our program, part, part of our program is on women's rights and the other part on economic development, for seven years in provinces like Karbala and Najaf and Hilla, which are religious conservative provinces. And here are American men telling Iraqi women that Iraqi society cannot accept human rights, women's rights. And it's a, uh, so it, it says, how do we not become, and that's not unique in Iraq. I mean, often it happened the same in Kosovo, it happens the same. How can uh, Westerners not be more conservative about a culture than the people of that culture itself? Um, and how do we not be so pat paternalistic about this culture than the culture itself? Um, and that's one of the, th so I absolutely see it's a collapse, it's between the collapse of the society, it's between the collapse of the infrastructure, um, the not understanding women, uh, women's role, to give you an example, all planning on restarting agriculture industry in Iraq, um, there is not one person who is saying women are 70% of the farmers in Iraq. And whether you talk to Americans or whether you talk to Iraqis, they say, no, 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 this is only for men. But men are the landowners. Women are the workers. Women are the ones who do everything in farms. And they said, no, 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 it's just the men. And so we're still part of the, America is very much part of ignoring women's rights in Iraq. You work in many countries, not just Iraq, but also Rwanda, Congo, Afghanistan, and you've been inspired a lot by the women you work with, haven't you? Just, uh, I gather you met some Congolese women who particularly inspired you. Well, a couple of things. I mean, I inspired... So to what one of the things that we do at Women for Women International, and I'll say a word about that and why I was inspired by them, is we go to war zones and we basically said, how can we help women move from victims to survivors to active citizens? And we do three things, four. One is group women in groups of 25, support network basically, where they meet every other week for a whole year. The second is every single woman in the program goes through an intensive women's rights training, be it her legal rights or her health rights, just knowing her body or knowing her legal rights or her political rights. 15% of the women we end up graduating end up running for local elections at their villages and municipalities and all that in different parts of the world. Then we also teach them uh, vocational skills and business skills so they can get job and they can get not petty cash but sustainable cash. So you see the transformation. You see women who come to us on a rata. Uh, Nabitu was one. When I met her, this woman had nothing. Um, she was 52 years old. She was homeless, nothing. And she went through our program, and I was interviewing her. And she said, she told me her story, how she was raped in front of her 20-year-old, 22-year-old, and 9-year-old daughters, how they were all raped in front of her, how her sons were forced to spread their mother's legs open, how one of them was asked to rape his mom, he refused, they shot him on the feet. It's the same, it's the, it's the stories that happens from Bosnia, 1993, to Congo, 2009. Um, and, and she's telling me about all the things that she went through, and she said, I never told anybody but you this story. So I told her, well, what do you want you to do? Because I'm someone who will come here and share the story. Should I keep it secret? Now, in the meantime, I'm actually negotiating with my publisher about my book on Iraq that was supposed to be on Iraqi women, not on me. Because who am I, a privileged young woman, to, to write about my story? And the publisher said, no, you really need to write it about your story. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Um, so here am I in Nabitu, with Nabitu in Congo. And she said, I said, so should I keep your story a secret? And she said, if I, tell, if I can tell the whole world about my story, I would. So other women would not have to go through what I've gone through. But I cannot. You can. You go ahead and tell the story, just not the neighbors. Um, now, a year later, Nabitu was on the Oprah Winfrey show. 
she told the story. Um, but a year later, she also graduated from the program. She bought a land, and land ownership is a major thing uh, for women's power. It's uh, economic power. It's also political power. And all her neighbors knew that she was raped, but she was a landowner. And she had pigs and cows and sheep and da 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 da. And they would greet her, you know, men would greet her like this, which is a sign of respect. And it didn't matter for her. But that moment when she told me, tell the whole world, was the most humbling moment in my life. Here I was, an educated woman, a privileged woman, you know, proud of my education, blah, blah, blah not nearly having her courage, that she had far more courage than I did in telling her story. I went, I cried for five hours in the way from, Rwanda, from Congo to Rwanda, called my publisher and said, I'm writing the book and it is about my story. But since then I believed, because since my encounter with so many women from around the world, Women for Women have about 200,000 supporters in all, all over the world and helped 243,000 women. In my travels I learned every woman has a story. And it's not about the global south or the western world. It's, ev it's about the globe. It's really about every woman having her own story, or most of us. I only met one woman who told me I don't have a story. Um, and that's fine, and lucky her. Um, <laughs> but every woman, in my opinion, most women have a story. And unless we break our silence, Unless we are like Nabitu or like Onarata who stood up in front of a line of men, governors and, and mayors and military and said, you need to understand this is what happened to me and you need to have responsibility. Take your own responsibility as to, about stopping it. And unless we, then we will die in our silence. As my grandmother died and as my mother died and we are, as you know, it's enough. Uh, and this is how we can stop the vicious cycle of that. And that's what we try to do with Women for Women. And what started with thinking that I'm helping other women end up being my own salvation. And I think that is always the case when we, you know, it's not about them, it's also about us. Zainab, that's incredibly inspiring. And I think it's a good point to uh, start to ask questions from you. So um, who wants to start? Living in the same premises as Sudan. Are, are you OK just to wait for the mic? Sorry. Hi, I'm Nina Dougal. Uh, I just wanted to know when you were living with Saddam's uh, family, uh, his son seemed to have had a bad reputation. Were you ever approached? Because you were, you were a good-looking lady, and your, the sons were also, I mean, you were 17, 18, 19, you were still there. So were you ever accosted by them? So again, we never lived at his compound. Uh, we're it was sort of yeah. like mixing we together. Were, yes, yeah. Uh, no, the sons were, um, were sort of isolated from us. His daughters, <coughs> which are more scary for me, they were like mini Saddams, um, <laughs> and really abused us in many ways. If they liked the shirt, they would take, send their drivers with us, and they would you know, say, take the shirt uh, off. And so their tailor would copy it. But it was like a horror. Um, no, my only encounter with Saddam's son was two, twice. One time I was playing tennis, and was wearing my tennis uh, short. And all of a sudden, he came and sat looking at us, at my coach and uh, myself, um, as we were throwing. And I knew the coach was scared, and I was scared. And we just like, you, you can't stop playing, because you will insult him. But you can't continue to play too long, <laughs> because it's scary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just had to pass a couple of balls, you know, back and forth, and immediately when he turned his head to talk with a friend, the coach said, go change and leave in the back room. Um, and that was my only encounter. And the second encounter was the day of his engagement. Um, and it was an important day for me because it's the day I gave up. Um, I was um, 17. And I was so emotional, it's so silly. My resistance as a teenager that I will always wear uh, dark clothes or blank, uh, whatever, blank colors and very simple clothes. And his daughters were, it was the taftas, uh, it was the 80s. Big shoulder pads, the taftas, the, uh, lots of makeup, um, bright colors. And I was insisting that that's, I'm not going to do that. That's how I'm resisting, a teenager. 
and they always laughed at me. They did not like me at all. I did not like them either. Um, they, you know, whatever. I was the odd person out, and my mother often would come in the parties. These are the women's parties, and would tell me, "Smile, just could you please smile sincerely and not looking like you're smelling a bad smell?" You know, and I was like, "Yes, mother." You know, and I would laugh. And I remember torturing my mother in the process. Um, that she was so embarrassed that I would do things like that. Um, that one day, I went to her and I told her, dress me the way you want me to dress. And she made me wear a yellow dress, which I get so emotional about that yellow <coughs> dress, because it's the day I gave up. And she put me in front of her dresser and she put makeup on me. And I just remember going to that party and it was our day's engagement. And I remember being the odd person. I felt like a clown where everyone was looking at me. Um, and it was, you know, but at the end, it's these silly stories that impact us, right? This was my story of surrendering. And it was so silly. It's just a silly yellow dress that I still remember it. Um, but that's the, my second time of meeting his son. And I've never met any of them. Uh, I met the girls much more than the sons. Sorry. <laughs> it's OK. <Yeah. laughs> it's OK. But since then, I faced my fear. And in the process of writing my book, I honestly realized that so much of my fear was my own ownership that I was nurturing it and I was comfortable with it and I was so scared to get away from it. And it was an, a rigorous, very painful process of writing the book. And to be able to tell you all that this is what I've gone, this is what I've, my story, um, and not cry. Um, but I realized that actually we have to own it. And we have sometimes to jump off the cliff without knowing how it's going to land. But telling the truth is so worth it. My mother, when she ended up dying, she was 52 years old. And she told me I regret every time I was upset. Three quarters of the times I was upset, it was not worth it. Um, so I vowed that I will live my truth every single day, and it just ain't worth it. Well, she was, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Question over there. Yes, sorry. I, I, I was really curious what you were saying about the Americans. Um, I'm terrible with microphones. Is it on? Um, I was curious what you were saying about the Americans, that they seem to um, discourage the idea of empowering women. Do you think they merely have a blind spot, or do you think that they're hesitant about empowering women, because really empowering anyone could be a threat to any agenda that they have for the country? Well, I actually want to be, uh, I should clarify, and I should be very careful that um, be, uh, it's not all Americans, because Secretary Clinton, I thought, is ma I think, is making brilliant statements about women. And I couldn't agree more with her about the connections that she's creating between food security, investing in women, and national securities. I think um, her comments going to Congo and saying, oh, what I'm going to talk about is the rape against Congolese women is brilliant. She's really changing the dynamics of bringing women into the limelight and what's happening to them. So that's. I should clarify because I'm actually very much think that she, what she's doing is changing the, where the limelight on women and putting it in a different pr uh, perspective. And I think there's a huge disconnect between that and Americans in Iraq. Huge disconnect. Uh, because while she's talking about the importance of investing in women farmers, there is no investment in women farmers in Iraq. While she's talking about women's education and women's health and all of that, there is no investment in serious ways in, in women's education and women's health. Um, while we need, to, well, she's talking about in moving women out of poverty, a lot of the focus on Iraq is on middle class, which I have nothing against. God knows I'm one of them. Um, but, we can, but Iraq is no longer a majority middle class country. Iraq is a majority poor country right now. And unless we pay attention to the impoverished population, um, we can't go anywhere with this thing. So, so there's no, not big investment is happening on the poor. So the, these are the discrepancy. Now, you have a new administration. You also have a new ambassador. You have new waves of um, ambassadors in Iraq. And you hope that there, was be, there will be a change. That's my experience from just two months ago. Um, and that's my reality. But you don't think that perhaps what's being said by Clinton and certain politicians isn't just sort of PR and uh, what actually is happening out there for reality is really the reality that America wants? I, I don't know. I think the question for all of us is to how do we hold her and hold everyone accountable?
um, women talks, uh, women <coughs> issues have for long been talking the talk but not walking the walk. Um, so I think, so I'm willing to give that a leap of faith, but I think the issue, it, we are by no, far, by no means to relax about, oh, we're okay right now with the new administration. We have to hold everyone accountable. And this era is about walking the walk. It's not about talking the talk, because I am done with speeches uh, in Women's Day on that, you know? Um, so I don't know. I do know that there are a few things that we need to pay attention to. For example, U.S. Congress just passed $150 billion for the war in Iraq and Afghanistan but $600 million for investment in development and diplomacy in Iraq, and $1.5 billion for investment in diplomacy and development in Afghanistan. And frankly, I just don't understand, because unless the proportion is, are going to change, we're not going to have peace, not in Iraq and definitely not in Afghanistan. This is not a war of guns. Uh, although it is a war of guns right now, but it can't be won that, that way. Um, so yes, we should. it's about holding accountability, it's about seriously understanding why we need to understand war, not from a frontline discussion of fighting, but we need to understand war from a backline discussion of what, which is what women deal with, um, mostly. And how do we understand? So growing up in the Iran war, uh, Iran-Iraq war for me, is not about the front lines where everyone talks about the front line. Is it how, about pe how people survive? How do they go to school every day? How do they keep life going every day? And we need to understand war from that backline discussion, not only for the war's understanding sake, but because peace also needs to be understood from that part. Because right now, peace is about the signing of a peace agreement and the stopping of fighting. And we need to have peace is about the building of life. Uh, it's not simply the stopping of fighting. Um, I was in southern Sudan. We have an office in one of our offices in southern Sudan. And I was asking a woman, what do you, how do you define peace? And she looked at for, down for a second and she said, peace means I have toenails. I was like, excuse me? And she said, well, for 16 years during the war in, uh, in the south, I walked the whole time because I was kidnapped a few times and was forced to carry the ammunition and water and food for rebels and was raped in the process. So I was afraid of staying in one place. So I would not stay for more than five days in any one place. And in the process, I did not have toenails. And since the peace agreement, I stayed in one place and my toenails grow back again. And she said, that's for peace for me. And unless we understand peace from a toenails perspective, we're missing it. We think it's about the stopping of arms, or so, it's not, the arms are still going, but of fighting. And we really need to make pieces about the growing back of toenails. Any more questions? There at the back. Um, when you visit these war zones and meet the women, how much do you feel like there's a camaraderie amongst the women, like any sense of sisterhood? Are they looking out for each other? Is there a sense of that? Or sometimes the women just as damaging, not physically, but to each other. I mean, are they, are they, is there a sense that they're kind of sticking up for each other? That there's war destroys trust between communities. That's one of the first things that war destroys. It destroys the social fabric of a society. Um, so, so I can't deny that aspect of it. My encounter with women is mostly, um, sometimes it's women that we've never approached before. And I, they physically live in darkness. Not only, uh, it's just it's like, I, I particularly have Congolese women in mind where they, it's like this hiding in dark rooms and fearing anybody seeing them even because they are raped or they've been through so much. Um, but my encounter with the women that we work with, which is, I mean, we deal, Women for Women deals with about, we were just on the Oprah Winfrey show last week and just got 12,000 new women in our program. And so we deal with the, so the new numbers are about, you know, 62,000 women on a monthly basis in eight countries. Um, and these, the reason we put them in this 25 women is to rebuild that support network and the social network um, and to have that safety network for them. I remember meeting a Congolese woman, she says, who has HIV and she says, I just hope I die after I graduate from the program, not before I graduate from the program, A, because I want to buy land to leave my, for my kids, but I already dealt with all my support system that they will take care of this child and this child and this child. 
part becomes the only time in which they talk about their rape or domestic violence, which increases tremendously more. Uh, but what reminds me, the reason I smiled when he first asked me the question, when I was in Congo in May, there were thousands of women in one of our centers, and they were singing. Now, I learned, I was a, hor I was a very shy person, believe it or not. But mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I learned how to dance both because my mother told me that before she died. She said, you really need to dance. Um, and because I start hanging out a lot with the women I work with. And they dance. They dance so much. And they were dancing and they were making a song. And they were singing a song. And I asked one of my Congolese colleagues, and I said, what are they saying? And they said, she said, they're saying, thank you for bringing the movement to us. And they are referring to the women's movements. We never talked to them about a women's movement. I'm so touched. But they were excited that they felt part of a movement. Um, and so there is definitely camaraderies from women who are singing that to Bosnian women or Kosovar women, which I also was there in July, surrounding abuse of husbands' houses and stopping domestic violence as it's happening, basically forcing themselves into the house as the husband is beating their wives and saying, stop it. You know, and all the women forcing that out and moving a very private issue to a public issue. Uh, so it's definitely there is a support. But you can't take that for granted. And they need the safe haven and the safe places where they can actually grow that and learn that. And that's one of the things that Women for Women International provides. Um, I'm interested to know, did you know what your story was when you sat down to write it? Or did it take, a life, take on a life of its own as you started writing? And do you think you'd have written the same story if you were based, if you'd been writing it in Iraq? Or if you'd been writing it, well, as you did, I assume, in the States? Um. The story was about my past. It wasn't about my. It wasn't even about my present. It was mostly going back. So I knew um, what I wanted. I knew the. Yeah, I knew what I was. Uh, it was very painful. The painful part was, and, and I'm glad I had a co-author with me, and, and who was an American woman and did not know much about Iraq at all, and it was really good, because though it was very frustrating at times, but it was really healthy. Uh, healthy frustration um, because she would ask me a sentence like well how could that happen or what happened in here and I thought I told her the story and I would go and we did the whole book over email we, I would write and she would edit and send me back more questions and I would write and um, and so I would go to my room and I would lock my room and I could cry for hours and hours and hours and hours and more comes out and it was, I felt it was like an a, a unshutting a, a mummy. Every time you open a layer, you think, oh, I'm healed. <laughs> and then there comes another layer, and another layer, and another layer. So the development of that, and how much I was forced to remember based on her questions. I told her once, I was like, this is torture, you know, for you to, to ask me these questions. But I was really forced to go back into these moments in which you, the brain locks it because you're so scared of going back to it. Um, until the stage, the process of writing it, I thought, oh, OK, I'm OK. And the process of talking about it was two years of intensive crying, actually, until what I feel was um, a dark stone was resolved. Honestly, it feels like it transformed into a crystal in my chest. And I can talk to you about it without getting exhausted or crying. And it's OK. Um, I think the second part of your question, um, I don't know. America for me definitely was the land of is the land of opportunity for me. Um, I was able to really manifest my dreams and my hope in America. It's, it's true. I, I wouldn't deny it. Um, though I'm upset at how is America destroyed Iraq, um, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be founding Women for Women. I wouldn't be working with Congolese women, which I adore, or Bosnian women, or Rwandese women, if I wasn't in a, if I was in Iraq. Um, so it was that. Now, it wasn't the question whether I would have written it in Iraq. I believe all Iraqis need to, to have the storytelling, because we all need it. It was how I convinced my father um, and my family to, to, because I wanted their blessings. And it was for Iraq. And I said, we have to tell the story. 
we have to tell the story because if we don't tell it, history would record us as being part of Saddam Hussein's entourage. And only us knew that we were not. Um, and the dynamic is, and I hate getting into Sunni Shia thing, I don't believe in that. Um, but my family was, was Shia, so everyone is surprised that I am, that he put us so close to him. And they were unpolitical. But the point is, he never saw us as part of him um, because we were Shia. And the people never saw us as part of them because we were so close to Saddam. And I needed to write it for not only for our, my own healing, but for, the, his, for everyone to know what, was it, what it felt like to be in our position. Because we were lost in between two, we are neither here nor there. N none of the sides accepted us. Um, and it was, and that's how I told my father, you need to give me your blessing, because I need to tell the story. Um, and I would, what I was touched the most, so I don't know if I would have written it, if I, I had no idea. I have been out of there for, 90, for 20 years now. But I know I am so deeply touched by the Iraqis' response because I was horrified. I was so scared of what's, what the Iraqis are going to say. Are they going to kill my family? Are they going to shun me? All kinds of, I had all kinds of fears. And I'm deeply touched every time I meet an Iraqi and they thank me for the book, or Iraqis in Iraq, or in here, or in America, or hug me and cry. I'm so deeply touched that my people, you know, um, and I'm still an Iraqi, very much, um, had accepted me. It's, um, uh, when I was in July in Iraq, I, I met a guy and someone told him, you know, her father was Saddam Hussein's pilot. And this guy was tortured by Saddam. And he looked at me, and he was from the South, so it's even more. And he looked at me, and he says, I see Zainab. And I was so touched that he sees, you know, that Iraqis see me, and they don't see my relationship or my family's relationship to him. Can I ask you a quick question? How it felt at school? I mean, did you, did you feel at school that you were on Definitely. your own? Definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have classmates who would sing to my earrings uh, songs pro Saddam because they believed, they told me my earrings had uh, bugs, uh, like uh, microphones. <laughs> so no wow. one was my friend. Um, really, they, I mean, I, I also had, you know, so it was, it was, oh, Zainab is, uh, um, and I didn't have, I mean, I had classmates, but um, no buddies uh, because they all suspected me. And rightly, I mean, I don't blame them. I never blame them either. And is that a big part of the pain of your, your story? Or uh, that's a big part of the pain in my life because I feel like since then I've always, I'm a workaholic, for example, and my whole journey has been to prove, um, to justify myself, to justify who I am, me. Um, so I work a lot, for example, because I feel I need to prove my value. It's, uh, it's constantly, and I just turned 40, couple of weeks ago and Happy now I'm birthday. like thank you and I'm just in at peace of saying okay I, I need to stop justifying me uh, but but that impacted me a lot because I was never treated for me I was treated for Saddam um, so it, it had just a personal impact on who I am you know the, this all this feeling inside you did it come out as uh, um, distrust or not being friendly or not somehow not getting close to people as you said you're a workaholic but here you are in one way working with people but then with all so much of pain inside you uh, were you able to really open yourself yeah. up no I actually no I'm very I'm overly trusting um, and I think people are at their essence are good I really believe people and I believe that there are people who are really bad. I think there are people who are evil also. Um, but I think most 
most, 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 most people, 19, are good in their essence. Um, and I love, I mean, I love, I love people. It's, um, no, it, it never did that. My mom was untrusting at the end of her life. Um, but no, and actually working in wars really helped me in that. A Bosnian journalist once said, war shows you the worst acts of humanity, but it also shows you the best acts of humanity. And I've seen that. I've always been one of those. I've always, in my encounters, I've always had a nice person out of the, mil of the blue helping me be safe. You know, so I actually just believe so much in the goodness of humanity. Um, I really believe in that. Zainab, um, I'm Iraqi. I work with um, a charity, and we work with around 4 million refugees from Iraq that came out of Iraq after the war, uh, after two, 2003. Now the problem, and actually it's, it's a great problem, beside all the, 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 the atrocities that happened in Iraq, we have something that we have to deal. I don't know if you are really dealing with it within your uh, uh, charity organization or organization as such. But we have the, the problem of uh, post-traumatic syndromes that is affecting not only people who are refugees outside Iraq, but people inside Iraq. How, what, what are you doing about this, or are you tack tackling this problem? Because this is not an obvious problem. This is something that is affecting women, men, and children in particular. And what that, that's what we are finding really, uh, uh, what uh, our organization is trying to, to take some um, uh, people from here to train the psychiatrists in, in Syria, especially because we, we have the greatest number of refugees in Syria. Uh, are you doing something about it? Because there is a new method of treating uh, post-traumatic uh, syndromes. I actually think the whole Iraqi society inside Iraq is traumatized society. Honestly, it's just a very, and it, the behavior patterns is of a traumatized society. Uh, when I was in July, I, there I crossed the street from the wrong way. And a soldier came to me and he said, next time you do that, I'll empty a whole machine gun on you. And I actually, it was funny for me. It wasn't funny, it was a trauma. It's just like the whole society is stuck in a trauma and we need to get out of it, you know? And I didn't take it personally. Like, this is his expression that he's just like, everything is killing and da, da, da. Um, well, the way we handle it at Women for Women is through these small group meetings in our centers where they come. Um, so I, as I told you, there is the women's rights part and there is the economic and vocational skills part. Um, the women's rights part, there is a good four months of it on psychosocial support um, uh, and different ways of healing. But it's by no means by professional. This is by social workers, not professional uh, psychologists. When there are cases, excuse me, we cannot handle, we refer them to other but there are not many in Iraq. But uh, Zainab, uh, maybe you're not aware of it, but there is a new method of treating the syndrome. It's uh, actually uh, a psychiatrist from here, from England, a British one, and, and he volunteered to go and train psychiatrists and people who works in the field to be able to treat. I mean, before it takes years right. and years right, to, right. for this to, to right. recover. So are you aware of this process? I'm very, I, I mean, I, I followed myself only because I'm interested in including EMDR and energy therapy and all of these things. Um, and we should table that for talking. And be, just behind you is Kate uh, Nusset, who is the executive director of the UK office, um, who can maybe coordinate on how do we actually take such skills. Um, we do that in many other countries because it's safer to take people, except for Congo, um, to train our uh, employees, but we actually do have the capacity of how do we actually train our Iraqi staff. So we'll we'll coordinate with Kate on how do we do that. Yeah. Can I just ask something? I think MSF is uh, sorry. Um, I'm I'm also Iraqi and I'm a charity worker, and I yeah. Um, there is a program by MSF in Jordan. We we can talk about it later after the meeting. Yeah. I think um, just on on that it it's not only the women it was it's for me and we don't deal with that at women for women the, the, it's a very practical program give her support give her some emotional break 
teach her about our her rights so she can have confidence fast give her a skill give her a job within one year to help her get a job you know it's very like more like a let's let's help her stand on her feet um, but it's the children that worries me so uh, in July I met a woman Wafa her name cooking on a Friday afternoon making lunch in her home some shooting in the uh, street her husband and her four sons go out a missile lands on her husband and he gets killed and all four of her sons are injured and today until today they are in different way impacted so Wafa gets into our program um, she gets in within a year she's doing well one of the vocational skills that we teach in Iraq is candle making but really nice candles like the one in the round and smelly nice one um, and they import it to um, an American company um, that is selling it at a very good price for the women so it's a good job for her and she became trainer and she saved some money and she opened a small store by from, from her very humble home and she even expanded her home after her. so she, her economic situation is better and she said please say no, don't call me a widow call me, I don't like it when you when people call me a widow because they categorize me as a victim and I need to be very positive for my sons and all of these things so they can keep on going so for me, Wafa, and there are so many Wafas in my life that I meet, whether it's a Congolese Wafa or an Iraqi Wafa. It wasn't her, it was her son, who was 11 years old, who is 11 years old. And I was interviewing, talking with him, and the boy saw his father killed in front of him. And he got, and he was crying. And, you know, I feel like Wafa, the adult women, they're, you know, they have the trauma, but because they are in the situation, they have to pick up and go. And it's the children, and now we don't provide services for children, and I don't know how to. But it's the, really the children that I, they break my heart because this boy, you know, was crying. And he's 11 years old, and he's seeing his father in front of him. Um, and that's when you don't know, if that's when I feel. I don't know what to do. A Congolese mother told me the same thing. Her boy, um, her son, three children, one of them was shot in front of her, in front of the other children. And she said, my children hate, you know, and, and you don't know, you know, it's like you almost need a, spe I mean, I'm sure other groups who provide specialties for children. She said, my children hate those who have killed their father and happens to be Rwandese. And that's when you know, oh my God, this war is going to be stuck. We were going to, we're going to be stuck in this war unless we do some healing in here. So that's, it's not an answer, but it's, yeah. yeah. How did you come to start? What made you think of starting Women for Women? Because I really think the way that you work with women is really excellent, because you're really down to basics, and that's so important. Um, so I was 23 years old. I was newly married at that time, for six months only. I had zero nishta, nada, wala ishi, wala flus. Um, I had nothing, really, no money whatsoever. Um, and I read the, in uh, Times Magazine, there was a front cover about the rape camps in Bosnia. And there was a picture of women sitting on a bed with their daughters and they were all raped. It's as simple as that. I did not know where Bosnia was. I remember my uncle had some business in Yugoslavia, but I really did not know much. Um, I had only been in America for two and a half years at the time, two, three years. Um, and I read the article and there were rape camps. And I said, we have to do something about it. So I was in school at the time. I went back to college, and I went to the library and to understand where Bosnia was and what's the deal here. Um, and then I called uh, women's organizations and said, um, I'm here to help. I would like to volunteer. And they told me, come after six months. Many of them, come after six months, come after eight months. And I was like, there are rape camps there. There are concentration camps there. And in fairness, it was also I was back in college because I was in, I did not finish my college in Iraq. I was in fourth year in college when I left. And it was my first time to learn about the Holocaust in America. And I remember saying, but they said never again there, but it's happening exactly again now. So I was like, but there are rape camps and there are concentration camps. How can we let it? And it was keep on calling these, you know, different groups until I found out that no one was doing much in Bosnia at that time. Since then, many groups worked in Bosnia. Um, and I said, okay, well, let's do something. 
and less sponsor women and less give them money and less exchange letters, which is the foundation of Women for Women's program. We ask every single woman around the world to sponsor one survivor of war by sending her 17 pounds a month along with a letter to start communication link between the two women. And we do, we ask that to ask is for a year only. Um, so, so I went, I knocked on different doors, the same women's groups I called. I was referred to the Unitarian Church. I don't know if the church exists in here. It's an All Souls Church Unitarian. And they said, um, we'll support you for a year until you stand on your feet, until you get your charity status and the tax status and all of that. And then you, you are on your own. So they helped us raise money. My former husband and I were saving our money for a honeymoon. We put that money also in and we went to Croatia. And that was it was a brilliant, it was a life-changing experience because I remember the first meeting, my 9 a.m. meeting was with a co woman called Aisha who was uh, raped for nine months in a camp. And she was released and she lost her baby in the process and it was a horrible story. And I remember going to my room and to our room and crying and saying, I'm, I, this is my life and this is what I'm going to do. Um, so that's how it started. Honestly, it started in 1993. We were, uh, uh, September 1993, I went back with money for 33 women. And September 2009, we are working on a monthly basis with 62,000 women. Um, and it was just, it, this is never the work of one person. This is, it means there are 62,000 women in 101 countries who are part of this. Um, and it means that there are 240,000 women who help 240,000 women in war countries, you know? Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Zainab, I just want to ask you one thing. We do need to have men supporting women to get anywhere. You talked a lot about, you know, women in trying to get women into parliament, but we know how terrible it's been for Iraqi women even to say anything and look at Afghanistan, the women. <coughs> I just want to know with all the different countries that you've been to, how it how the men have seen your wonderful work and whether they are supporting. Thank you so much. I, it's my favorite question. Mm. And thanks, Margaret, for that. Um, and I would, didn't tip her uh, <laughs> for that question. Um, the, we, long time ago, back in 2000, actually, we discovered that we really need to work with men. Uh, but we did not have the money to work with men, with the husbands, you know. Um, so we developed a training program, it's a four-week training program for men in leadership position. Um, and that means the chiefs, the pastor, the imam, the military commander, the mayor, whoever is considered leader in their community. And it's an intensive training program that doesn't mention the word women. I was, when I was in Congo in May, we, I was meeting with a lot of the men who were trainees and they were sometimes in their military uniform and they keep on saying women for women, women for women. And I turned to my Congolese colleague and said, do they know what our name means? Because they kept saying, we want to work more with women for women, we want more training. And she says, no, and don't tell, and don't tell them. Um, so it's a leadership training for men. And the logic of it is that if you want to be a good leader, you really need to understand what 60% of your population, or 55, and in war times, it's actually a big percentage of the population, of your population are asking for. And I'm fascinating, fascinated how we get into the discussions of rape, of domestic violence, of treatment of their own wives, of their daughters, in very intimate way. Now, the trainers are all men. And we've done some reports on them, and we discovered a few things. A, Men, no one talks with men, honestly. No one talks to the husbands who are abandoning their wives, and I, which I, at the beginning I used to be so angry at them, but as I start talking with them more, it's like he is traumatized. He is stuck in his own trauma for seeing his wife and his nine-year-old daughter raped in front of him, and he couldn't do anything about it. Not to justify his escape, but we need to acknowledge his trauma. No one is talking to the men who are raping. Um, as in one military commander in Congo, he said, before I entered this program, every time I, I entered another man's house and I had a gun and he didn't have a gun, I never questioned twice whether I could rape his wife or not. I always raped his wife. Until I realized I could get HIV. And that I could kill myself, I could kill my family, and I could lose half of my soldiers. And I have since 
stopped raping and ordered all my soldiers not to rape and punish them if they rape because I don't want them to die. Now, it's very pragmatic, very hard called it argument. Um, the story has to be continued that this man actually, after a few months when we went, I went to visit him again, he talked about um, how he's saving his money together with his wife and how his life started improving when he started sharing the money with his wife and moved from Estraha to uh, Mud Home. And then eventually how his wife became his best friend and now how he spent his own time, personal time, instead of with his friends drinking, he spends with his family going from one neighbor to another showing that how I could have a very good life. So there's a possibility for an evolution of an argument, in my opinion, but that we really need to to talk with men. We also discover that there aren't much work, there isn't much work with men, and when it is, very little, only in Africa. So it doesn't exist actually that the discussion of men in, in incorporating them in women's issues is almost null in other countries. So in Afghanistan, we trained 400 Imams in that training and helped them write their Friday speeches on women's rights. Is change possible? Absolutely. In Iraq, when women told us it is haram, it is forbidden for us to go out of our home, we went and got a fatwa from a Sunni imam and a Shia imam. And, and the fatwa says women's education and access to economic resources is not only permitted, it's encouraged in Islam. Went back to the committees, showed them the fatwa, everyone left us alone. Um, so it is absolutely possible, but we actually really need to address it's a black hole. Men are in a black hole. We don't know much about them. And we really need to reach out. And where I am personally in my life, I actually feel a great deal of compassion uh, for them um, because they're stuck in that black hole. Um, and it's a soul death. A rapist is experienced as a soul, is soul dead. The rape victim is okay, she's intact. You know, I remember an Iraqi woman that I interviewed who was 16 when she was kidnapped to be trafficked. And the traffickers were arguing whether they should rape her and sell her as a virgin or whether they should, uh, or, yeah, whether they should rape her or sell her as a virgin. And finally, they decided to rape her. She's 16 years old. She said, as he was on top of me, about to rape me, and I looked at him in the eyes and I said, please don't rape me. Don't you have a heart? I beg you, don't rape me. And she said, he looked at me in the eyes and he said, my heart has been dead a long time ago. And I feel bad for that man. In a not simply, you know, he's, he's horrible, but we, he, he knows his heart has been dead. And how can we actually reach out and restore it? And only compassion can help us do that. Any more questions? No. No? Well, Zainab, I just want to thank you very much. Thank it was you. incredibly moving, incredibly inspiring. There's a bit of housekeeping, but we should have talked about this beforehand. You've got a, which and of your books, or have you got them both? Over well, there? I wanted to do a couple of housekeepings. First, there is uh, some information about Women for Women, which I want to tell everyone about. Because in March 8th next year, which is International Women's Day, um, we're, having, we're having about 40,000 Congolese and Rwandese women meeting on a bridge that combines their two countries. Um, we've served these 40,000 women. We're talking with President Kigami and Kabila to meet on the bridge, actually, and witness these thousands of women saying, enough with the war, and we are demanding peace today. And we'd like to echo, and that started with this idea, and then our Bosnian colleagues said, we want to do the same, and Afghan colleagues said, we want to do the same, and our English colleagues said, we want to do the same. And so we're going to, um, we're trying, we're having, we're launching a campaign that Kate with a pink <coughs> sweater um, is launching, um, where we're asking every woman <laughs> and men to join us on meeting in bridges. Join women, join me, join, uh, join us in a bridge. Um, in, it will be a bridge in London uh, where we're also trying to echo the voices of not only the Congolese and the Rwandese women or Iraqi women who are stuck in war, but uh, where we hopefully um, have the whole world hear our own voices in this country and in other countries. Um, so it's a... Um, there's a brochure about that that explains how you can join, and we hope that you can join. And of course, we are trying to build uh, the grassroots momentum in this country as well. So we're asking for everyone to join us. And and there is also my book for those of us, for those of you, 
I don't know what's the, what are the rules about my book, but I hope you can join us in, at the Bridge uh, campaign, and I hope you meet us at the Bridge. Just tell us then, which of your two books is it? It's my first book, which is hidden in plain sight. Um, it's in the blue, which is my memoir. My second book is The Other Side of War, which explains war from a woman's perspective. Um, and I think that's uh, that. I actually always finish with Rumi. And uh, Rumi, is, uh, some of you have heard me speak in here, and Rumi is a 13th century Sufi poet. And I start my day with him, and I end my day with him, uh, because I actually think um, he, put, he helps me put perspective on everything in life. Um, so I want to, um, as we're talking about a bridge, um, one of my favorite poems, he says, out beyond the walls of right doings and wrong doings, there is a field, I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other, no longer makes any sense. So I humbly add that out beyond the walls of war and peace, there is a bridge. <laughs> Let us meet there. There is a field. I hope we all can meet there. So thank you. Thank you, Zainab.